Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds, and are proud supporters of WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities. What do Iowa voters want and who are the candidates who say they can provide it? A look at what's shaping up for the elections in Iowa in the cities. <laughs> Iowa voters will join the rest of the nation when they head to the polls in November, of course, but the state has some unique votes to cast and some new ways to cast them. Now, if you're voting absentee in Iowa, you need to make a request for a ballot and send it into your auditor's office by Tuesday, November 8th, Election Day. If it arrives late, it will not count, so you can't mail it on Election Day. And also, if you are voting in person, the polls now close at 8 o'clock at night instead of 9 o'clock, which was the historic closing time in Iowa. In Iowa, the key races will be who will get your vote for a number of statewide races like the U.S. Senate, the governor's race, Congress, and several state and local races. And Dr. Megan Goldberg of Cornell College watches the changing political landscape in the Hawkeye State, and she talked with us from her offices in Mount Vernon, Iowa. Well, thanks for joining us. I, I, my first question really is, what is the number one issue that's going to drive people to the polls? Do you think it's the economy and the pocketbook, or is it going to be reproductive rights? Yeah, so sort of canonically over history, we have what political scientists call the fundamentals model of elections. And what that means is that we think there are certain things that really drive election results, sort of regardless of what's happening. And so one of the main predictors of what happens in an election is actually the state of the economy. Uh, most notably, it's things like unemployment rate and GDP growth. However, that's not necessarily the same as things that will mobilize people to turn out. And so I think we can learn some lessons from what happened in Kansas this summer, where we saw something like abortion rights was a huge driver in first time voters showing up. And we know that that can make a big difference in elections. Like we saw in 2008, when we had this sort of historic candidate that had uh, the ability to turn out just an unprecedented level of young voters. So that could happen again in this election when it comes to some of these other sort of issues that are on the ballot. I wonder though, cause you bring up Kansas, which is a great example. And uh, there was this fervor after the uh, Roe v. Wade decision, or the Dobbs decision, I should say, but uh, does that seem to have waned, though, among Democrats? I mean, is, is, is there still that big push? Because it was such a fresh decision back in the summer when Kansans were voting. Yeah, so that's one of, I think, I guess, if you're a Democrat, one of the concerns is that our attention to this issue is going to wane over time. And that's certainly true. And so I think that's why we see a focus uh, from Democratic candidates in particular who would benefit from additional attention paid to a, the abortion issue, really focusing on the impact and these state laws that continue to be put into place. And so even though the decision happened this summer, we see more and more decisions happening at the state level and uh, Democratic candidates can kind of leverage those decisions. And that also keeps our attention on them um, because especially if it's in your state or in a neighboring state, we still have new activity related to the Dobbs decision. So we could still see attention on this issue and it being sort of a driver and mobilization factor. We're taking a look at the state of Iowa and in so many different ways, it, it, it's, it's a, described as a purple state. I mean, if you take a look at registration, it really is 33%, 33%, and 33% independence. Um, is that the way you see it as well, even though there seems to be this red wave in Iowa? Yeah, you know, so I think that Iowa is really interesting when it comes to our voter registration. And if we look at the last couple of presidential elections, if we look at state level elections, it seems like a red state. Um, you know, but I just, um, in cleaning out our office suite uh, this week, I found a 1988 presidential election returns map from Iowa, and the state is blue. 
And it's really wild to see as someone who, you know, wasn't in Iowa in 1988. Um, but I think that we see this split between Democrats and Republicans and independents that's almost even. And that's what's really interesting about Iowa. And what we know about independent voters uh, is that they often are actually more loyal partisans, depending on which party they sort of lean towards. And so there's a lot of reasons uh, in different states that you might say you're independent, register as an independent or someone who's unaffiliated or no party. Um, but I think in Iowa, it just, it seems like if you look at the election results, that we're turning into a red state um, and that those independent voters by and large are a lot of loyal Republican voters, even though their voter registration doesn't necessarily indicate that. Well, and if you look at an election map lately in Iowa, the blue only seems to be like Scott County, Lynn County, uh, Johnson County. I mean, the, the uh, Polk, I mean, the, the metropolitan areas. Yeah, and so that's indicative of sort of the patterns around the country, right? That one of the things that predicts whether or not you vote for a Democrat or vote for a Republican is sort of this like urban-rural divide. Um, and there's a lot of other things that are correlated with that. Um, race, income, education, there's a lot of things that are correlated with living in a high-density area versus a low-density area. Um, but I think that one of the things that's interesting about U.S. politics right now is what's less predictive of how you'll vote is what state you're in. But something like whether or not you live in a city or a rural area is more predictive. And that's those same patterns are true across the entire United States instead of these sort of idiosyncratic, unique state level politics. And it seems to be more than, let's say, race or gender or uh, if you're a union person, you used to vote Democratic. I mean, if you're a Hispanic, uh, you would generally vote to Democratic. Um, but if you're a Catholic, you may be voting more Democratic. These things don't seem to be uh, the way they were years ago. Yeah, so as we become more polarized, we actually have seen an alignment of sort of these other demographics and identities and our politics. Um, but they don't necessarily split on the way that they used to. So Catholics are sort of an interesting example because they're actually pretty split 50-50. But if we look at other religious groups, um, Catholics are sort of unique that most other religious groups split very strongly in favor of one party or another party. Um, right, and obviously no groups are a monolith, but we do see an alignment of partisanship and a lot of other demographics. It's just sometimes different ones than we have in the past. So for example, we talked about gender. Um, obviously women, again, not a monolith, but women are more likely to vote for Democrats than they are for Republicans. And so you'll always be able to find anyone in any group who is in sort of the party you wouldn't expect. But we have seen, um, there's a political scientist, Liliana Mason, who refers to it as the formation of mega identities, that we have all of these different identities that align with our political views too, and it forms these like really strong groups. And that's part of why polarization is so strong today. And very difficult to change right now. Yes. Uh, so partisanship is in itself a sort of a social identity as well. Um, and so there are times when it's sort of more malleable that when you are young, you're sort of figuring out who you are. But by the time you're in your 30s, you're pretty much set. And it's very unlikely that you're going to change your partisanship. And it's very unlikely that you're going to cross that party line and vote for somebody else. You might do that on one or two candidates, and but it's a it's a high burden for those candidates to sort of convince someone to reject their partisanship and consider the candidate on some other basis. I want to talk about a number of the campaigns, the statewide campaigns, and I think uh, a lot of attention, of course, as you would expect, would be the U.S. Senate race between uh, Admiral uh, Franken and Mike Franken and uh, Senator Charles Grassley. That it's an uphill battle for Democrats to unseat. Uh, an incumbent, especially one with as much experience as, as Senator Grassley. Uh, I think Senator Grassley's team didn't necessarily want Franken as their opponent uh, um, among the three Democrats that had run in the primary. But this race is kind of shaping up the way you expected it, right? Is that um, uh, Grassley with a solid lead? Yeah, you know, I think that anyone who was running against Grassley was sort of facing this, like you said, an uphill battle. He's someone with 
really strong name recognition, which is nine tenths of the battle in some ways. Um, it's a red state. It's a state, or we're in a period of time that's hard for Democrats in general because we have a Democratic president. It's the midterms. And usually the president's party loses some seats in the midterms. Um, so really, like the odds are all stacked against whoever is going to run against Grassley. Um, and so you have to run really like a, an incredibly tight campaign. And you have to do sort of what I said in, in, in the answer to the last question, that Franken has to convince all of these Republicans to consider their vote for Senate on something other than partisanship. And when we're talking about the U.S. Senate, that's just really, really hard. It's a lot easier to do when we're talking about like local and state races because you can appeal to sort of like local issues um, that might be unique to your area um, or some sort of other shared identity. But for Franken, it's just, this is really, really difficult. Um, and there's, you know, I think that it's not particularly surprising that the election has turned out the way it has you know, at this point in time. The other question, really, I mean, when it comes to the campaign against Senator Grassley, you know, age has to be an issue, but you have to tiptoe around it if you're the opponent. Now, the question that was asked to Senator Grassley in one of the earlier debates was whether or not he would serve out his entire term. In other words, is he just running in order to win and then have an appointed uh, heir to replace him? And he pledged to uh, uh, run and serve the six years. Um, is age a difficult thing to campaign against? Yeah, you know, I think in many ways it is. I think especially when it comes to Grassley, right? He'll hop on social media doing push-ups. Um, and, you know, I, I think that age is a hard thing to run against. And I think that's why we see the focus on how long he's been in office and sort of a narrative of it's time for a different voice. Um, it's time to give someone else a turn. And that way it's not about age, right? It's about how long you've been in DC and been doing this and it's time to maybe switch uh, the hands of power. Um, so it's certainly a hard thing to run against. You know, I think it's also, again, um, if you think about a potential of Grassley had been up against Finkenauer, I think we might've seen very different dynamics when we're talking about, you know, a woman in her early thirties because that's such a contrast. Um, but when it comes to Franken too, right, obviously he's, he is younger than Grassley, but it's a little hard to, it's a, it's a different dynamic to bring up age when you have two men who are both, you know, senior citizens running. Um, and so, you know, age is difficult, but it's, I think, a different dynamic in a race when the candidates are um, not sort of a stark contrast to each other. You also have a bit of a contrast in the governor's race. You have uh, Kim Reynolds facing Adidra Dejir. Um, Reynolds is getting a number of uh, positive pieces of news. If you look at, you know, the budget surplus, uh, the plan because of the budget surplus, uh, uh, reduced tax rates for businesses. Um, she's campaigning on the fact that uh, uh, she got us through the uh, pandemic without shutting down the state. Um, that seems to be really resonating right now. It's almost like uh, 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 the ship is sailing fine. Why change? Yeah, you know, I think one of the interesting dynamics here is that um, at the national level, Republicans are sort of trying to run on the economy, right? That the economy is so bad right now. Things have gotten so much worse under Biden. And Reynolds has to sort of come in with a counter narrative that everything is bad everywhere else, but things are fine in Iowa. Um, and so I think that's sort of an interesting dynamic to watch. Um, to paint this picture of like Iowa as remaining healthy, the performance in Iowa has been fine, even though the rest of the country is terrible, is, is not in good shape. And so you should vote for Republicans there as well. Deidre Dejir is basically running, you know, much of her campaign on education. Um, and, and let's be honest, for young families or for women, that could be a compelling uh, issue. Um, and in Iowa, where uh, it, it was a state so well known for education, you know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, it, does that seem to be one of the big issues would be uh, investing in education, um, investing in uh, post high school education as well? Yeah, so I think this is also a really interesting example 
um, of gender in politics because women are usually seen to be more competent when it comes to issues of education. And in the governor's race, we have two women running against each other with very sort of opposite views on how we should approach public education, both at the K through 12 level and higher education. Um, but education, I think, can be a huge motivator uh, for a lot of voters, especially those who are affected by it every single day. So if you think about young families, you think about parents, they are interacting with the government through the educational system almost every single day. And so that can have a big impact on the way they think about the government, um, as long as candidates are able to sort of connect those experiences to their campaigns, to the issues. Um, and so I think it, it can make a difference, especially in those places um, where schools are suffering the most. And I think it's also sort of strategic of Dejir because the Republican Party in Iowa seems to have some division within them about education. So if we look at Reynolds' voucher plan uh, from earlier this year, we had a number of Republicans, especially those from rural areas, who opposed that plan. And so I think it's really strategic for Democratic candidates to sort of pick up on that opposition and focus on their support for those public schools, especially those small rural schools. It's also interesting because, as you said, um, regarding the voucher plan and, and the Reynolds education plan, some Republicans didn't back it, and they got a backlash from the governor's office. I mean, she was she was ready to flex her political muscle. Right, absolutely. And so we actually saw that in uh, my own district here that we have a representative who uh, had a primary challenger who was supportive of the voucher program. And it was one of the few cases across the state where that primary challenger actually lost. Um, and so I think we see Reynolds sort of coming in, using her clout as party leader um, and the resources she has at her disposal to sort of tighten up the Republican Party because a divided party is not, especially when a governor has this sort of majority in the legislature, um, she needs to, to, for them to be cohesive and unified to support her agenda. In the Iowa Quad Cities, of course, it's the uh, newly drawn first congressional district that gets a lot of attention with Democrat uh, Christina Bohannon, a, a law professor for the University of Iowa, challenging uh, Representative Marionette Miller-Meeks. That's the big uh, uh, showdown in uh, southeast Iowa. Uh, Miller-Meeks, of course, famously winning by six votes over Rita Hart uh, two years ago in a differently drawn district. Do we expect it to be just as close or, or uh, obviously it wouldn't be as close, but I mean... Is it that competitive in this district still? So I think that Marionette miller Meeks still has the incumbency advantage going for her. Um, the incumbency advantage is real. It's very strong. Um, but miller Meeks has only been in turn, has only been in office for one term. Um, and like you said, it was an extremely, extremely close election in a district that even in the newly drawn boundaries is still quite close in terms of party registration. So I think that there's a there's reason to expect that it could be close, um, but that it's still going to be, you know, obviously anytime it's a challenger, it's always going to be an uphill battle unless you've seen right after redistricting a major redrawing of districts that leans it towards the other party. The key for Bohannon would be a very big turnout in Johnson County, of course, Iowa City, which is basically what got Dave Loebsack uh, the surprise victory uh, years ago, and he also being a, a former University of Iowa, well, I guess current uh, University of Iowa uh, professor. Um, is, is that the key to the first district is is really getting out the vote in both Scott and Johnson counties? Because those are your two blue Democratic conclaves, the rest really a sea of red. Right, exactly. So for any sort of Democratic candidate uh, in the newly drawn District 1, um, it's going to be mobilizing your party's voters. Um, and so, you know, you can sort of see that in efforts. There's a lot of efforts around Iowa City and the surrounding areas to sort of make sure people are registered, make sure people are excited about the election and sort of getting them to turn out. So um, especially sort of in the state where polarization is this strong, it's always sort of a mobilization battle of how many more people can we get to turn out. You pointed out that Iowa is becoming much more of a red state. And, and about two years ago, Democrats really thought they had a chance to make some inroads in the uh, Iowa House and the Iowa Senate, which are both controlled uh, by Republicans. That failed, uh, surprisingly failed two years ago. 
Is there much hope of any advancement for the Democrats in the state house uh, for this particular election? Yeah, you know, so I think there's some really interesting races sort of going on across the state. Um, and I think there are some really strong Democratic candidates who are really focused on trying to sort of focus on the long haul right now and trying to build community and organization efforts uh, and really stress that you need sort of year-round organizing um, and a presence for the Democratic Party. Because the problem is that the Democratic Party has sort of just like exited uh, especially the Western part of the state entirely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so very much so. Um, and we really have noticed that Republicans have, you know, as far as registration in, I believe it's the fourth congressional district. I mean, it is overwhelmingly Republican and very conservative Republican at that. Right. And again, it's still sort of a little bit of this urban rural divide. So one thing that I think looking forward for Iowa is to look at what areas are growing. Um, because some of the fastest growing areas in Iowa are those metropolitan areas. And so sort of the, the question out there is, is that going to make the metropolitan areas more purple? Or is this sort of increasing uh, the population of these blue areas that on the map, it, right, it looks small, um, but it's not about land, it's about the number of people. And so if those blue areas are growing in terms of population density, uh, that's enough to sort of counterbalance what looks like a sea of red, but there aren't that many people in it. Let me talk to you a little bit about the candidates that are running in Iowa. It was a few years ago, maybe uh, six years ago, uh, we were talking to uh, Senator Maggie Tinsman, former senator in Bettendorf, who had helped create a group called uh, 5050 in 2020. The idea being uh, they wanted 50 percent uh, female candidates, if not female office holders, by the year 2020. Of course, we're two years beyond that. It didn't quite reach that. But take a look at these races that we've got. I mean, you have got a woman only races for governor, the first and the second congressional district. Uh, Cindy Axney is looking for a reelection in the third district. Uh, what does that say about uh, the inclusion now of women actively involved in politics in the state of Iowa? Yeah, so I think this has been really a really interesting time um, for folks interested in gender and politics in Iowa. Um, so what we know from uh, a huge body of research on trying to improve women's representation in politics is that one of the most influential things you can do is sort of actively recruit women to run. Um, because women often feel like whatever qualifications their male counterparts have, they need more than that. Um, and so women, if you ask like a, a man and a woman with the same sort of qualifications, uh, a man who says he is willing and feels qualified to run for office, a woman is less likely to say that. Um, and so this is why recruitment really matters. And so I think what this is the result of parties and other organizations taking seriously the recruitment and training of, of women candidates, right? That this doesn't sort of just like happen by coincidence. This is purposeful recruitment of these women candidates. Looking into your crystal ball, and I know you're going to hate this question. <laughs> is there any possibility that you have any idea what the turnout might be? I mean, does it seem that because uh, people vote by their pocketbook, you now have Roe v. Wade or the Dobbs decision uh, in, in a lot of people's uh, perspective. Do you think that's going to drive a lot of people to the polls in Iowa? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, I think my expectations are um, that we could see something like the Dobbs issue uh, and we can see, um, you know, sort of concentrated mobilization efforts in some places, increasing turnout, especially among registered Democrats. Um, I think the thing that I'm sort of most interested to, to look for uh, is to see what happens among Republican voters when you don't have Trump and uh, on the ballot and sort of what's happening in a midterm election when Trump's also not in office. Um, so it's sort of a question of we saw in 2020 that a lot of Democratic voters were sort of mobilized against Trump. And so the question is how well are Republicans sort of mobilized against Biden? Um, and so those are sort of the, the patterns that I'll be looking for. But I think there's some sort of, there's a lot of cross pressures that are going to drive down turnout, some that are going to drive up turnout. Um, and so my sort of boring prediction is that it'll be pretty predictable for a midterm election year. 
Our thanks to political science professor, Dr. Megan Goldberg of Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa. I'll have a program note in a moment, but first, here's Laura Adams, Out and About. This is Out and About for October 21st through 27th. Downtown Moline will hold their first Dia de los Muertos parade the 22nd from 2.30 to 4. There's a family Halloween show at Common Cord the 23rd at 3.30. Front Street Brewery holds a week of celebrations for their 30th anniversary beginning the 24th. La Dama, the Latin alternative band, perform at the DeWitt Community Library the 25th at 6. And it's time for Geneseo's Halloween event, Witches Night Out, the 27th from 4 to 7. Plus, there's a fright night in the park, Schwiebert Park, that is, on the 27th from 5 to 7. The Quad City Botanical Center hold their not-so-scary Halloween walk the 27th and 28th, and there's loads of craft shows starting with Ladies Craft Night at Icons on the 21st, Urban Teak QC, Back Road Fest in Walcott the 22nd from 9 to 4, plus the Christ Church Craft and Vendor Show in East Moline the 22nd. Oktoberfest Quad Cities takes place at the Hallberg Estate with fun for the whole family the 22nd from 12 to 9. Don't miss the hilarious lineup at Stand Up at Stardust at the Stardust in Davenport the 27th at 7.30 or a very Bucktown Halloween at Davenport Junior Theater featuring the Quarter Moon Tin Strips Bluegrass Band the 21st at 7. While the moving two-act chamber opera To Remain takes place October 22nd at 7.30 at Augustana College's Bruner Hall. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. Over the last four weeks, we have talked with all four candidates running for the two congressional districts that directly impact the cities. We were able to talk to Illinois 17th District candidates, Democrat Eric Sorensen and Republican Esther Joy King, as well as Iowa 1st District candidate, Democrat Christina Bohannon, and the Republican incumbent, Marinette Miller-Meeks. These interviews can be seen the weekend before the elections on WQPT as well as streaming on WQPT.org. Please watch it, and we hope you get something from them. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device, and streaming on your computer, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Wheelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds, and are proud supporters of WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities.